All right, good afternoon, folks. Chris Dagger right here again, your host for Off Bishop Street Podcast. And believe it or not, we're already at four, episode 14. Yes. Isn't that wonderful? Like 14 episodes. The podcast has been relaunched about a month ago. I think it was around April 25th or 26th, so that, that's about a month ago. And I've been able to interview 14 wonderful people, or I'm about to interview the 14th person. Uh, and today I have the pleasure of having a Reverend Carla Holmes. That's me. So, Carla, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you. Wonderful. Can you just, uh, again, frame a little bit, please? Um, so, you know, I think we have a friend in common, you know, mm-hmm. Nandan Gunan. Nandan Gunan was, or is, rather, not was, is a student in uh, theological studies that I've had the pleasure of studying with. We're actually organizing an African theology conference, hopefully this coming fall of 2023, with uh, Ernest and Olali Khan, some... Uh, some friends that are both uh, from, I think, respectively, uh, from Ghana and Nigeria. And when I asked Nandan about his faith, you know, he talked about the Anglican faith, and um, having been to a couple of Anglican churches in Laval, Montreal, myself, I really um, noticed a lot of commonalities with the, the faith that I grew up in, in, the, in Catholicism. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, now I'm more of an overarching Christian, like I tend to say, like I'm, I go to evangelical services, uh, Orthodox services, Lutheran and Anglican services. So I'm, I'm really curious about Christianity as a whole. So that really sparked my interest in uh, inviting doc, uh, doctor, did we say reverend? Doctor, reverend, reverend. Yeah, not a doctor. Oh, not yet. You can call me master. <laughs> yeah, master, yeah. <laughs> master, reverend, um, Carla Holmes. So um, let's dive into the bio, first and foremost. Sure. Uh, well, you know, I was not a church goer my whole life. I didn't start going to church till I was in my 50s. So um, I was a teacher for many years. Um, I taught... Concordia, I taught here at Concordia for about 30 years, English second language. I did not know that, that's yes, great. And now you know. <laughs> the more we learn, right, about yeah. Concordia and the uh, Concordia roots. Yes, absolutely. I taught at Cégep de Vieux Montréal also for about 12 years. Mm-hmm. Um, it was during my teaching career at the Cégep that I started feeling a very strong pull to be involved in, uh, in the church. I, as I said, I wasn't really, I didn't have a historical involvement with the church, not even as a child. Um, I've always had a strong sense of, of spirituality in the sense that I've always been aware of the, the mysterious element of, uh, of the world of creation. Right. Um, I'm a big science fiction and fantasy nerd, uh, so that was something. Uh, the thing is, uh, of course, it's not religion, but it opens oneself up, those kind of genres open people up to the idea of something beyond what you see in the world now. So that's always been a part. I was a musician too, and my first degree is in music. So music also opens one up to something that's different from the everyday reality of the world. It's so easy to get drawn into. So once I started going back to church, it wasn't long before I really, I was hungry for theology. I was starving to death. Nothing was, I never read the Bible before, and I started to read scripture, and I was like, okay, this is, I did morning prayer every day, it was like zero to a hundred. Um, I fell in love with the idea of searching the face of God. It was something very important for me. So I did all my studies and I, ended, I was halfway through my master's in theology when it occurred to me that I had a, um, I had a calling to the priesthood. Mm-hmm. So, um, <laughs> which was a, kind of a terrifying thing. I'm twice divorced, didn't have a background in the church, not exactly who one would think of as, you know, your typical um, minister in the, in the church. And in fact, I remember when I went into, I, I did my, uh, I did my seminary at McGill, and when I went to talk to some of the professors there in seminary, and I said, oh, I really don't feel like, not like it's even possible that God would call me to the church. And I said, yeah, I'm divorced, I'm living with my boyfriend, blah, blah, blah. He says, I'm a perfect candidate. <laughs> so I thought that that was so, um, such a relief for me. It was uh, a way of, of opening that door to a possibility that I didn't think was, was even there. So um, moving into, into the seminary, it was like, okay, yes, I felt more and more. This is where I was supposed to be. And uh, I was deacon, uh, I was ordained deacon in 2008 and ordained priest in 2009. And then uh, I've been working ever since. That's interesting because I've always, like with the Anglican tradition, I've always debated in my mind of trying to figure out, do we call the, the leader in charge a pastor or a priest or... Oh, yeah. At first, I was I was calling him pastor because they were they they're part of the Protestant family of Christianity, but, but then I realized I'm actually a priest. 
Yeah, yeah, we're not we're not actually Protestant. Oh, okay. We're Anglo Catholic. Anglo, okay, Anglo Catholic. In the Catholic, sense right. that we never, we weren't part of the Protestant Reformation at all. Wow. Um, we just, it was a political decision mm -hmm. why we broke off from the from the Pope in Rome. Um, the King of England at the time did not like the idea of some guy sitting in Rome telling him what he could and couldn't do with his church, because of course he was the head of the church. Right. The king traditionally was the head of the church. So when this bozo from Rome decided to tell him what he was going to do with his church, he said no and cut ties with Rome. Continued on in the one and only church at that time, there was no Protestantism. Right. So continued on in the church in England, mm -hmm. in England. So we are the church in England and that branched out later. We were, of course, the church in England was influenced by the Protestant Reformation, but it wasn't a part of that Reformation. That was the Lutheran. Right, right. The, the Luther, and uh, then afterwards, you, you have, like, you know, history is quite interesting because if we look at, first and foremost, the Protestant Reformation with Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. And I remember writing, like, a pretty lengthy paper in my first semester just about Luther, the, the Reformation, the history around uh, the Holy Roman Empire and what okay, we call it. You know more than I do about it, so. <laughs> well, I, I actually went to DDO um, to attend a Lutheran service mm -hmm. and interview Pastor Jim Slack. Oh yes. Who uh, you probably know, and uh, great guy, honestly, mm -hmm. and uh, he really bathed me into Lutheranism to understand what exactly it is, and just the ins and outs, and the conflicts with the Anabaptists in, in Europe. And uh, then I asked him, like, because I didn't know the difference between um, Anglican and Episcopalian, mm -hmm. and he basically answered that Episcopalian is Anglican, but in the United States. Yeah. Um. Right. Yeah, that's right. Just a different. A different way of like Tucker Carlson, I think he's uh, like, you know, probably familiar with what happened recently with Tucker Carlson leaving Fox News. Yeah. So there's that story going on, and he he's pretty open about his Episcopalian faith, right? Um, just as a sign up. But then, I mean, thanks for clarifying that uh, you know Anglicans don't actually or, or Anglo Catholics don't actually consider themselves as Protestant because from a Catholic point of view, I've always perceived up until the first 25 years. I'm 28 now. Uh, that you know anything outside of Catholic like that Christianity has three branches. So you have Protestants, Catholics, and Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And Orthodox actually broke off from the Catholics in 1054, right. which was about 500 years before the Protestant Reformation, right? And even before that, 500 years before 1054, you had the Ethiopian Church that that had their Oriental Orthodox tradition. Mm -hmm. So, and then I was you know as I TA'd in Concordia, and I. You know, chit chatted with some of my, my colleagues. I noticed something that there's a common trend in the Christian world that, you know, if Christianity started around minus four, around when Jesus Christ was born, minus four to minus six, or minus six to minus four, rather, and every 500, 500 years we'd have like a schism, mm -hmm. right? So the first 500 years we had a, a schism with, or the, what we would call Catholics had a schism with Oriental Orthodox, then 1054 with the uh, Eastern Orthodox. And then in 1517, you have the Protestant Reformation, and now, like, we're 500 years removed, or more than 500 years removed from the Protestant Reformation. So, are, are we undergoing a new schism in yes. today's world? Well? Human beings being what we are in all of our glory, I think it's really, uh, it's important, I think, to, like Augustine, I think, said, dividing the, the, the church of God from the church, the, the physical manifestation of the church in the world. Right. Like, of course, we have the, the theoretical idea of the church, uh, what God wants for God's people. And the church is a relationship with a God and a relationship with each other. I mean, those are the two, the two rules that Jesus talked about and gave us. Love God, love your neighbor. Uh, that's, that's the basic of the, the mystical church. And we always strive for that. But being human beings and still caught in time in this world, we, we get all mixed up in power struggles and po politics and all that kind of crap. And we, we are always yearning for the, the purity of a relationship with God, but we always get caught up in politics. I think all of the schisms, I mean, you and I, we're, we're, both, we're both Christians, but I imagine, you're a Christian, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I imagine our ideas of what God is and what church is are different. I look at my congregation, I've got like 65 people sitting there, each one of them is an Anglican, St. Thomas, rah, rah, and each one of them has a relationship with God that is completely unique. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, there are things that are similar in everyone's relationship with God and things that are different. And the similarities, um, and those similarities and differences are not often articulated. 
So people don't know that they're in complete disagreement with the person sitting next to them in the pew. Right. When that some starts to become articulated and starts to be uh, something that's important politically in a power structure, that's when we get scared. Mm -hmm. I mean, the regular person on the street just going along saying, yeah, I just want to be a good person, I want to be in my relationship with God, uh, they're not going to formulate a schism. But when they hear people saying something that's against how they see God, yeah, that's when it starts to be important. And when it starts to be uh, something that will break up the church, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's the moment when you get schism. Like what happened with the Anglican communion where the whole uh, same-sex blessing and uh, same-sex marriage uh, split. I mean, it is in the process of splitting the Anglican communion because the, I mean, Anglicans were, uh, I mean, uh, the thing between Anglicans and, and Catholics in the sense is we've gone our own way since 10, whatever it is. Um, we are more Protestant, I think. Depends on the church. Right. You know, we've got, we call it higher or lower up the candle. Mm -hmm. So if you're high up the candle, you're more Anglo Catholic and you're very close to, the more, actually, more Catholic than the Pope in the sense that Vatican II didn't happen yeah, to the yeah. Anglicans, the Anglo Catholics. So we still have this very high, uh, very uh, ritualized way of worshiping God. And then you've got low on the candle, which is totally Protestant, like not even communion every Sunday. So we've got these two things, both happily Catholic, or happily Anglican. We have the evangelical wing, we have the, the conservative wing, we have the progressive, everything is still is still considered Ang Anglicanism. And because it's so across the board, you've got people in, like where Nandan comes from, uh, who's, we always have the same book, we have pretty well the same book, the Book of Common Prayer but it gets expressed in different ways according to where you live. Mm -hmm. But mostly that's okay. Mostly that's not a problem, unless it becomes political. Then it becomes a problem, and then you have a schism. Mm -hmm. And what about the Bible? Like, I'm guessing the Bible has, does it have the same 73 books, including Maccabees and Tobit? Mm -hmm. no. Yes, yes, depending again on, I mean, we use the Apocrypha, we do, uh, and I think Protestant churches do not, but I'm not so sure about that. But definitely Anglicans, we have a apocrypha, and it is part of our lectionary, so we do lectionary readings from that. Um, but basically, it's just even churches, and there's two churches, and Anglican churches in Montreal, one in Montreal West, and ours in Western NDG, and it's two completely different expressions mm -hmm. of church within blocks of each other. And people say, oh, you know, I'd never go to St. Philip's you know, church because X, Y, Z, or I'd never go to St. Thomas because X, Y, Z. Well, community. You know, people want to go where they feel welcome, where they feel loved. So that's okay. I don't think we have to be, we don't have to march lockstep. Right, like, I mean, if I can speak for myself, like it, I tend to be super ecumenical, even though I, you know, for the first 24, 25 years, I've really been, I've really seen everything from a Catholic lens, but when I started going to, you know, non-denominational or Baptist or Pentecostal evangelical churches, to name a few, that's when I started to realize the, um, not only the denominational differences, but especially the liturgical differences, mm -hmm. and the, even the eschatological differences, like when it comes to talking about, uh, you know, soteriology, like the salvation, the end times, future events, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. perspectives on, on scripture are, pretty significantly different, despite the many commonalities that all Christian denominations have. Mm -hmm. That being, you know, the, the main one that I've always framed was belief in the uh, res bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, right from the cross. Uh, so that's always been the main intent. So as long as that's set in stone, to me, I, I think it's perfectly legitimate for a Christian to open their arms to different folks from different denominations. I mean, I lost power for five days during the Easter weekend. Mm -hmm. So yes. we were, remember that? yeah, and like Laval, we got hit hard, so we lost power for like five days straight. Mm. Um, or maybe like we had from Wednesday to, to Saturday, then Saturday evening came back for half an hour. The thing blew up again, and then we had to like wait another day for it to get uh, power back on. Mm. Um, so that made us miss Easter Mass for the first time in like two decades. Um, so I was thinking, okay, well, I have a plan B. How about I go to an Orthodox Easter, which is like, 
a week afterwards. Smart. <laughs> Smart, but uh, still, like, you know, uh, I text my, my orthodox, I'm like, okay, what time's your service at? They tell me 10 p.m. Uh, 10 p.m., I'm gonna show up to church at 10 p.m. Like, who's gonna, who's gonna show up to church at 10 p.m.? Show up there at like 9.55, the parking lot's packed with, with cars. I walk in, 10 p.m., I notice that the same liturgical process is repeated over and over again. So, and, and again, that's new to me, so I was like, you know, flabbergasted by the fact that the, ser <laughs> the service didn't, was never ending. So I look at my, my clock when the service actually ended, and I watch him. It's at one fifteen in the morning. Yeah. I, I'm getting out of here. I'm not saying hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting the, the heck out of Happy Easter, but I'm, I'm gone. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So that was my way of kind of exposing myself or finding that opportunity in in that hassle that we had to deal with mm -hmm. an opportunity to expose myself to another ranch, mm -hmm. which I've been to, but not that often. Mm -hmm. um, so, but a lot of Catholics, especially I noticed. Um, are very staunch on their position, and one Catholic priest specifically told me not to go to other services uh, outside of the Catholicism, and that could have sparked um, a serious conflict, because then I obviously, you know, I, I kind of debated the issue, and I was in disagreement with that particular claim. Um, but I'm wondering, like, at your church, are there folks from other denominations that show up and say, hey, hi, I'm Joe, and I'm from a Lutheran church or whatever, and that kind of thing? So totally. When um, our church is kind of a, a gathering place of many other churches, and they're closed. So St. Thomas was, when I first came to St. Thomas about 13 years ago, um, they're a very small congregation, maybe maybe 20 people or maybe less. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those churches that everybody said, ah, you know, who they're dying and blah, blah, blah. But around us, churches started closing. Really? Okay. And it just so happened that I personally had a relationship with those other churches because I was um, I was involved in them as a curate. So when the church closed, they said, oh, here's Carlo. We know Carlo. We're going to go to St. Thomas. So that kind of, we kind of gathered in the people around. But of those churches that closed and came to us, there was a very vast difference in churchmanship. But it was okay because they felt, com they felt safe. And then the United Church, Protestant Church, uh, two blocks away from us closed. And they just came to us because we were close. Mm -hmm. And so they became part of the fabric of our, of our church. Um, we are not dogmatic. Um, I'm trying to think, we had people in our church that were Native, and so they had that, they brought that Native spirituality into, into our midst, which was- Like Indigenous? Yeah. Like uh, so that was part of, who we were, I can't remember. I mean, once they get there, it's just like, you don't think about it too much. Um, we tend to be very open-minded in general. And so we've never really felt like, oh, our way or the highway. It's never yeah. been part of, of our mentality because we're not afraid. I think a lot of when people say, oh, don't do anything different, you know, it's, it comes from a place of fear mm -hmm. that they're afraid that, you know, it's a kind of sweet, they want to protect God. No, God does not need our protection. Right. <laughs> we need God's protection, right. not the other way around. So we don't have to worry that, that God is somehow going to be damaged unless we're super orthodox. Well, I, I think they're, I think they want to protect their own beliefs. But they, they, kind of, they want to, they're fearful for their own cocoon in a way that they don't want any heresies yeah. to penetrate that cocoon. And that's kind of a synonymous word with, their partner word with, uh, with schism because, mm -hmm. you know, schism's, came about because of heresies in, in whatever, um, in, in their own dialectic, they would say that, you know, the, you know, the her heresies, like uh, the Protestant Reformation was a heresy or of some sort, but it's it's such, it's be become such a dirty word when at its root, etymologically, it's just, you know, school of thought. That's what heresy means, yeah. right? So, like, I'm, I'm the biggest heretic of them all of that, in that case, because if I'm going to dabble in these different schools of thought, uh, for my spiritual growth and to get closer to God, then I'll be the biggest heretic around. I'll, I'll, I'll probably wear that to, that label, even even if it's it's now a completely dirty thing. It's okay, God loves you. All right, <laughs> amen to that. Right? <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the thing. Like it's it's like everybody if everybody's going to sling that word at each other. We're, not, we're never going to find that uh, that particular peace. And sometimes I feel like Catholic are purport, Catholics are reporting that they are like unified and universal. But wait a second. If we look at Celebricantus, like Mel Gibson, if we look at the fraternity of 
St. Pius X, right, the, the traditional Catholics. If we look at the Novus Ordo, like even within Catholicism, there are many schisms. Oh, for heaven's sakes, yes. Right. And I think the, you know, not little I know about Catholicism. I did study at Concordia, so. Right. And I did a whole course on Vatican II, which was, uh, which was really, really interesting. Um, but I think even within Catholicism and anywhere in the world, you get pockets of different thought and they're orthodox within their own space. But if, if they try to dialogue within each other, then like there's this frantic kind of, oh no, that's not right, no, that doesn't not sound right. good. Like the whole idea of those, um, of the group of women who wanted to be, or, and did get ordained Catholic priests. Interesting. Priestesses or priests? No, no, priests. Priest. Like, okay, I'm I thought priest. they were like, priestess. Right? <laughs> so, priest. actor, actress, it's just actor yeah, 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 or yeah, doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's drop this test <laughs> there. But, but that was, of course, in, within their context of Catholicism, that made perfect sense. But, of course, within the context of Catholicism, in other areas, it did not. It's, uh, it's just, we can't expect total orthodoxy. I mean, Jesus never wanted total war. He was a Jew, for heaven's sake, you know? And within uh, within decades, uh, there was a whole other religion that wasn't Jewish, but was still based on the, the life and teaching and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. So, I mean, even at its absolute basic, there was this idea of non-orthodoxy. And I mean, take a look at the big councils, you know, uh, to try to figure out what was and what wasn't orthodoxy. Right. And so now we're still at that place where we're scratching our heads and saying, you know, oh, you know, they didn't say this at the Council of Nicaea, you know, then therefore we can't think about this in, in 2023, you know. Um, so it's just, uh, it's, it's a complicated kind of thing. And I don't think we should expect, why would we? Every human being is different, so why yeah. would we expect our and our relationship with God? If anything is open ended, it's that. You know, even our relationship with each other is very hard to pin down and, and classify. So how could we possibly think that our relationship with God is classifiable or even have a desire for it to be classifiable? Right. I mean, first of all, I, I agree and it's not realistic to expect total orthodoxy. In, in the whole of Christianity and even when we step beyond Christianity and start looking at different religions like Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, and Judaism, mm -hmm. you know, even even then, like we can't expect everybody to believe in the same particular uh, doctrine or set of doctrines rather. And you know, just this morning I was at a Muslim conference at McGill just to you know learn more about Islam. You know, having having bumped into a particular Muslim fellow at the MSA. Uh, event uh, in, in the LD building, at the library building, and maybe a month ago there was a Muslim event, like a Muslim Awareness Week type of thing, and I just walked by and started looking at the, the questions on, on the board, and one of them is, uh, do Muslims love Jesus? And that kind of sparked my interest, and somebody said, hey, yeah, yeah, you want to talk about uh, Islam? Like, yeah, sure. And uh, is there anything that um, caught your eye? I'm like, yeah, like, do Muslims love Jesus? And he said, absolutely, we love Jesus. Yeah, so prophet. Now I knew that they knew Jesus, but I didn't know they loved Jesus. Right, and then we went back and forth on you know the Quran and different you know biblical scriptures versus Quranic uh, scriptures, and we had a very one a very um, fruitful conversation. Mm. Um, so even beyond Christianity, I'm pretty sure that you know God is the ultimate judge, right? Regardless of people's religion or denominations or whatever, like Shiites, Sunni, or whatever, like all that, I think. It is, is impertinent when it comes to, you know, God's judgment. And, yeah, yeah and luckily with God's judgment, I mean, there's something in Scripture that says, you know, thank goodness God doesn't judge us according to, according to an impartial judgment, you can really screw. So basically God judges us through the lens of love. And right. that is, you know, few, <laughs> because none of us would poss could possibly live up to perfect justice. We're not. So because God loves us, we, we know that. Yeah, it's, it's easier on us to be judged by God than it is for us to be judged by each other. And in terms of that judgment, like when I started going to different evangelical services, I started to learn about uh, being saved by grace through faith, mm -hmm. right? That, that particular statement. And now, as simple as it looks, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of depth into that particular question because what exactly is grace and what exactly is faith? And if we're saved by grace through faith, 
and it's, really, it's and that's biblical. That should be a universal tenet for, for all Christians. It's just that you know evangelicals tend to put it at the forefront to remind people that you know God is the ultimate judge when it comes to His grace and our faith in Him mm -hmm. and being saved in, in that sense. And I think I'm pretty sure all Christians can believe that regardless of the number of sacraments that people go through. Absolutely. Ironically, you know, we all know that, that you know, we're, we're saved by, by God's grace, but we're very quick to tell other people they're not saved according to our lights. Right. So maybe they're saved by God's grace, but they're not saved in mind. I remember walking down the street once. This was in Montreal, walking down the street, minding my own business. I may or may not have been wearing my clericals. I don't recall. This guy comes up to me and says, have you been born again in our Lord Jesus? Right. I looked at him and I said, I'm an Anglican priest. He says, that doesn't matter. I'm thinking to myself, if that doesn't matter, you know, I'm in trouble. Right. Yeah, well, okay, well, what did that, what doesn't matter question or statement lead to, like, well, what did he mean by what I think that he meant, matter? I think, you know, I've also heard a lot of people, I don't know too much about the church in America, in the U.S., but a lot of the people that I have heard in the U.S. will say, uh, Christians and Catholics. Yeah, but that's and again, that's a semantics error because Catholics will claim that they're Christian because they <laughs> are. So. Because they are, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, but, but, and it's the kind of thing too. Unless yeah. you are my flavor of Christianity, you're not safe. Mm -hmm. Unless you believe exactly what I believe, lockstep with what I am, uh, God will not. Uh, according to my lights, what I know about God, God will not uh, accept you. I will judge you. And so a lot of people wrap themselves up in, into knots by their friends who are not following their particular flavor of religion. Oh no, they're all worried because their friends are going to hell. Right. Yeah. Because and they have to save them. They desperately right. had to save them, and it comes from a, a place of love. But I mean, it, it's really, it's really not. Um, it's not logical. It doesn't make any sense. Liturgically, not liturgically, but but theologically, right. it makes no sense according to scripture. And yet, that's the pe thing that people will tie themselves up in their knots about. So this guy is saying to me that it doesn't matter whether I'm an Anglican priest. The uh, the idea was uh, that means nothing uh, because it does not fit in with his idea of what it means to be saved. Oh, the, I mean, the way I can also hear it is. Um, it doesn't matter, meaning that perhaps whether I'm an Anglican priest or not, or an evangelical or a Catholic or an Orthodox or whatever religion, it doesn't matter in the sense that um, God ultimately decides, right? In, in that sense, if, if, if there was like a je m'en foutisme mm -hmm. around, like a, a laissez-faire type of attitude, then in that case I would agree that, yeah, it doesn't matter in that sense because because mm -hmm. God is the one who saves and oh, we don't okay, save. That's a generous interpretation. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> could I try could to, be, could be. To give the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> Why not? Um, yeah. So, yeah, so that's, let's, let's rewind a little bit and, um, and uh, pull back the, the curtain a bit. So, uh, so for the first 50, um, yes, so for the first 50 years, you weren't really, you know, uh, in depth in the Christian faith? Or, that's true. And then was it your master's degree at Concordia that allowed you to start asking questions? Um, it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, it came, it was not a, me getting involved with religion was not a conscious decision. Um, I was halfway through seminary before I wrapped my mind around the resurrection, for example. Oh, that's a good so I wasn't really thinking, I was thinking, hmm, I wonder what I can do with my life now. Let's look at this now. It was like, I didn't think about it. I just, I went with my, God knows me very well. So God pulled me in the direction of least resistance for me, which was through my feelings. Like I just wanted to be in church. Didn't it wasn't a decision. I just felt like I wanted to be involved in church. Didn't question it too much. And what really brought about that that uh, change of heart, that momentum shift? In a sense. Well, I hate to sound pretentious, but I had a religious experience. Sure. Which was not something that I expected. We need more of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so after this experience I had, um, which is a very strong connection, I felt with Jesus. After that experience, I didn't think about it. I took it as a gift. It was a, it was a lovely gift. My goodness, that kept me going through some very, very difficult times, that, that knowledge of God's love. and But I, I didn't take it anywhere. I just accepted it. But 
I noticed that if I look back on it, it was during the year after I received that gift that I started to be more involved in the church. Not because I thought I should or because I wanted to or God wants me to do that, no. It was just because I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And the more I got involved with the church, that's all I wanted to do. That's all I wanted to read about. I just wanted to theology. I wanted to, like, it was zero to nothing. But it wasn't really a, an intellectual decision. Zero intellect involved in it. I mean, I, I, I'm, not an, I'm not an unintelligent person, but I'm not driven by any kind of logical... I mean, I have it, obviously. I can be theological if I need to be, but it's not what drives me. Certainly not what drives my relationship with God. So I just kind of went with the flow. God called me. It's as if, you know, when God calls you, I heard a lot of priests say to me, oh, you know, when God called me when I was, you know, 20 years old, but I ran away. I didn't run away from God. You know, God said, you know, whistled me and said, yes, okay, here. what do you want me to do? Anything, anything. I often think of myself as, you know, God's shepherd, like German shepherd, like a sheepdog because uh, I'll do whatever God whistles me up to do and do it with great joy. But it's not an intellectual kind of thing. Well, I mean, we can anthropomorphize that particular example with something that's in Scripture because uh, Jesus talked about, you know, the, the shepherd, and if the shepherd loses one of his 100, he would leave the 99 aside just to go get that one lost one. And um, in, in a sense, it's, it's not a... It's, it's not a bad idea to look at the human being as a, a sheep or, or a lamb, rather. Mm -hmm. And even, even Jesus, like in the book of Revelation, Jesus compared to a lamb, or the sacrificial lamb. Right. Uh, and, you know, that metaphor really, you know, not, poses a nice picture when it comes to our relationship with the Creator, right? Why yes worship? and no, because people don't like, A, people don't like to be sheep. Or animals. <laughs> yeah, I noticed you yeah. changed sheep to lamb because we like lambs. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. God talks about sheep. Right. There's a taboo sheep. regarding. Yeah, we don't want to be a sheep. Yeah. But in relationship with the infinite God, we are. Like we are not. I have a dog. You know, my dog. I love my dog. Um, but my dog does not have my capacities. So I don't think he thinks that he does either. He's very happy to you know, have me open the can of food. He's not going to do it himself. Um, and I think that we have, human beings have a hard time with allowing God to be God. Right. And we want to be God, and we want God to be our henchman. Especially today. Like yeah. Oh, yes, oh, yes, of course. So I, I think that the, the idea of being a sheep, and of course, you know, we also eat sheep. So <laughs> we don't like we that lamb. idea. We eat lamb. <laughs> we eat lamb, we eat it all. And when Jesus is the Lamb of God, of course, it's, uh, that's referring to the sacrifice, the sacrificial killing of a lamb to offer the blood to God as a, as a, as a temple sacrifice. So we've got all that going on too. But um, yeah, the shepherd, the idea of, of Jesus as our shepherd, it's okay, Jesus can do what Jesus wants with me. You know, I'm, I'm a Christian, I follow our Lord, I follow the way. So I trust that Jesus is going to do with me what is necessary to live for the kingdom. Oh, absolutely, I mean, especially when we put our lives in God's hands, and that's something I really had to learn in my early twenties. That because I, you know, I, I still am kind of a control freak. Not not, a, not controlling other people, but controlling just my my circumstances. And you know, sometimes I just have to understand that you know, the more you plan, the more God laughs or something. That kind yeah. of thing. So you know, I, I tend to want to do too much, but then then again, I have to remember that you know, my life has been given to me by an exterior force, a greater, you know, a, a basically God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he gives life and he will take life back. Right, that's that's always what I've been told, but I'm, I'm kind of stubborn and I didn't really want to listen too Along much. with the rest of humanity. Yeah. So, but now, yeah, I, I do understand more and more that, you know, if we allow God to take the, the steering wheel and let him be the director of our life, you know, that, that would, Save us a lot of troubles. And it takes the pressure off, that's for sure. Yeah. You know, especially in the church. My situation is the, the church is dying in Quebec. Like it's it's obviously dying. And a lot of my poor people, they you know, they feel this responsibility that they have to, you know, prop up the church and because, you know, poor God, what's God gonna do with it? God knows what God's doing, you know. Right. We don't have to worry about that. It's not our department. You know, that's God's department, it's God's church. 
And so we, we just have to be open to the, the promptings of the Spirit wherever it appears, rather than trying to force God into those church buildings, you yeah, know, and yeah. lock the door so God doesn't get out. You know? So, but, but because we can, it gives us a certain amount of freedom. Um, I think that the idea of, of love and fear, that's been so hard for our church right now, in, especially in Quebec, because we're afraid that if we're not there as the bastion of the church, then, then there will be no hope for us. There will be no love of God. But God has written God's laws in our hearts. We don't need the church to tell us about God's love. It's in our hearts. Mm -hmm. I know many an atheist uh, because of my background. Most of my friends are atheists. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know many an atheist who are like the, close to the kingdom. You know, they're, 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 they speak with the words of love, of compassion, without sitting one foot in the church. In many cases, you know, don't want to darken the door of the evil church, you know, okay. and who can blame them? So I, it allows me as a leader in the church to feel, I guess free is the word, to feel hopeful and optimistic. Because I think God still loves God's people. And what happens with the church it may not look like what, what we're used to, but God's never abandoned us before, and I don't imagine God will in the future. So we're still, we're here, you know, we're here. And let's, it's our job to love God and love our neighbors, you know, simple but not easy, as they say. And uh, we can just dance through the world with impunity, you know? I mean, for sure, like, that, that's basically the rapport that we should have with, with the world. When, uh, and, you know, also I have, I kind of retain something else from the Bible. It says we're in this world, but not of this world, kind yeah, of thing. Paul had it right there. Um, which is quite the you know the yin yang or the the limbo that we have to go through. And um, you know, you reminded me of a movie I just watched a couple of days ago, Jesus Revolution. Oh, no, I haven't seen it. So I, I watched it, uh, and it's it really talks about um, a kind of a revival that happened in the states, especially I think starting in California and. Uh, this guy, Lonnie Frisbee, was leading a whole bunch of what we would call hippies to adopt Christianity in, 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 a, in a sort of, um, without necessarily removing the hippie aesthetic that comes with it. Mm -hmm. And it kind of sparked a huge movement in the, in the United States um, in the 70s and 80s, I think. And those were the years where, you know, Obviously, television had been invented by then, and, and what was televised and mediatized was the fact that uh, America, even Canada in that sense, was going under like some sort of debauchery, or, so, or just a, um, you know, a, the, the American values were getting dismantled or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you have this guy, and, and there, there's, you know, another, another, another one of the characters is Pastor Greg Laurie. And pastor Greg Laurie is an active pastor in the United States. He has a huge mega church, obviously, like a lot of. A lot of them, but he seems like I've listened to a few of his sermons. Seems to be very genuine, um, and it really talked about life as being in Greg Laurie and, and their life and how this movement came to be and how the hippie movement kind of went under Christ in that mm -hmm. sense. So I'm wondering, if, I mean, now in 2023, is, is that even possible? Is that could that even happen? Like, uh, well, you have, I went through the 60s. I remember the 60s because I'm a boomer. Don't hate me. Um, but the thing around, around the 60s and 70s was this sense of optimism that uh, really fed in, even in Vatican II, you know, Vatican II was a very optimistic right. kind of time, and Christianity and Catholicism were going through all of these wonderful things when, you know, uh, everybody brought out their guitars and, you know, charismatic movement. Yeah, right. charismatics and, you know, women more involved in the church. Of course, right after it went right back to where it was before, but it was a time of optimism. It was a time of hopefulness. It was a time that that people thought the youth were going to save the world from the old fuddy duddies that happened before us. I can see what's been happening now too. But um, I think what is different now is this sense of doom that we have because of climate change, because of the, the horrible demonic thing that's going on in the U.S. at the moment, um, the idea of inequities within finances of the countries being split apart by financial inequities. We've got all of that 
but it's more uh, apparent now than it was back in the 60s, 70s. We had the, I mean, when I was a, a child in the 50s, we were worried about the bomb, that, that was a big thing. It was the part War. of the doom and gloom, the Cold War. Yeah. But in the, the, in the 60s and 70s, it was like, you know, we're, we have a counter narrative to all that. Mm -hmm. Not sure the counter narrative is that, is there right now. I think the people are afraid and that fear is what drives a lot of the of the spiritual tensions that are happening. People are afraid, and uh, the narrative, the Christian narrative, which is based on love of neighbor, that's the real countercultural thing that's happening. Because right now, society tells us fear our neighbor. Yeah, that's it. That's crazy, and I don't, it's it's really disheartening because you know. If there's one central aspect that distinguishes the Christian message, it's love. Mm. If we can't love one another, yeah. then I mean, where, where's the salvation in that? Like, where where do we go from here? And where does society go? If like we're, we're educated to because at the root of all hate is fear. So if we're educated to fear others, it's highly likely that we go down a slippery slope of, of hating other people. Of course. And which is the exact opposite of what the Bible says. The Bible says love your enemy, yeah. right? And which is very hard to do. Who wants to love an enemy, someone who hurts them and persecutes them? Mm -hmm. But when put in practice, as hard as as hard as it is, that's what fosters love, right? Absolutely. And it's hard. It's a hard lesson. I think that's the, the kind of the, the mission of Christians these days. I think a lot of Christians feel like their mission is to gather like-minded people together and circle the wagons. Yeah. But in fact, I think our mission is just to show the world what it means to be a loving community. Right. And instead of being secluded in our respective silos and, and not talking to other people and exactly. not mixing and not, you know, I, and I understand that sometimes that sense of stability is, is comfortable, but I think, you know, I hear a lot that people have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's that's how we grow, and that's how we how we evolve and go to strive to better better things, right? Um, and I'm wondering, like, as as a priest, uh, is that something that you really focus on, like this message of love, and even if it's hard and difficult, like to, to go and, and reach out to, to those that hurt or uh, or those that that do ill will onto you? Or oh, so totally, totally, totally. Um, I will tell my people that it's not easy being a Christian. It's not easy, but it's good. You know, it's the what we want, what God wants us to be in this world. It's a challenge for sure. And if you, if people don't go to church, I don't think people need to go to church to feel good, comforted all the time. I think the idea is you go to church to make yourself feel good. It's like you know, a, a stress, like getting your your cozy little blanket and wrapping yourself up. Church is not for sissies. You know, churches to get out there and see what it is to uh, to put your faith in God into practice in the world, and that is how we make connections. That's how we see ourselves in uh, bringing in the kingdom of God. That's my message every Sunday. That's what I, I preach on that all of the time. It's very important for me that I often call church school of love, mm -hmm. and that we come together to encourage each other. Right. Basically, that's what church is, coming together to encourage each other to love God and love our neighbor. Right. Not not rocket science. For sure. And like I'd be a liar if I'd said if I told you basically that the the drama that may happen between church members and you know, I know that not only in my church where I grew up, but like in, in different churches it's a common demon or de denominator demon you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to play out what words are. Uh, yeah, it's a common denominator to see that, you know, oftentimes uh, human beings are human beings and, and drama actually uh, comes comes out sometimes and people may have conflicts and disagreements or dislike this, that, or the other person in the church. Um, but yeah, I would agree, like, it's, you can be a sister when you're in church and uh, it's, it's hard to sometimes try your best to love someone that... Uh, or care about someone that you, your gut reaction is to dislike, mm. right? I love conflict. I love conflict in the church. <laughs> because one grows. 
know, people say, oh, well, you know, it's so nice. We're, we're all the same underneath. No, 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 we're all different. But that's a gift we give to each other. Our differences are gifts that we give to each other. It makes us crack open and grow. If we're in a disagreement with someone, then you have to, you know, figure out why that's happening, what's behind it. Do they have a point? Do they don't have a point? Now let's get together. How do we do this? How do we make something grow from, from this conflict? Without conflict, there's, it's static. There's no growth. People just getting together, singing the familiar hymns, you know, doing the prayers and feeling good about themselves. And there's no growth there. Right. It's 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 dead. You know, it's, it's right. comfy, but it's dead. Yeah. So coming together with different points of view, and you know, I love it. I love that. Yeah, having different absolutely, and um, I prefer someone. Um, I prefer someone, you know, disagree with me to the point of hating me, but in my face and knowing it's plainly, bluntly, and honestly, over someone who is going to pretend to be a friend mm -hmm. and pretend to like me. And I, I really, I prefer conflict mm -hmm. in, inside a church over a whole bunch of people pretending to like each other, yes. when in reality they may have mm -hmm. different issues to iron out, and they don't do so because of fear. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Clarity is so important for a true communication between people. You can't be clear with each other. And I think in churches are the best place where you can at least trust that the other person and you are on the same page as far as a love of God goes. Right. And that we do all of our, be our best selves because God loves us and we love God. So that calls out us being our best selves. Mm -hmm. So that's when we bring God into conflict. You know, we can pray, like often I've had my, my church is perfect, so you have to remember that. Oh, yeah, of course. We're perfect. Well, I'm going to have to visit you, man. <laughs> yeah, please do. Um, yeah, come with, with uh, Nando at some right. point. But uh, the thing is, uh, often if there's any kind of conflictual thing that's going on in a meeting, we stop and we pray. Mm -hmm. We bring God into the equation. And it's amazing how much it will calm everybody down. It grounds people again. Right. And uh, uh, that's an important aspect of our human relationships. The fact that we are also in a relationship with God, and we acknowledge that. Because, of course, we're all in a relationship with God. But not everybody acknowledges that. But once you do acknowledge that in a, a group situation, then you've got that resource. And I think then we don't have to be so afraid. Right. And I think that's a nice uh, strategy, basically, to remind everybody that we're here for a common reason, which is to attend the school of love. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, despite all our differences and conflicts and, and, and disagreements, we're fighting a common enemy, right? We're, you know, there's devil out there, there's Satan out there, and... Yeah, we're fighting fear and despair and hatred and anger. Just like Paul said in all of his letters, right. you know? Look at the light side. Turn away from the dark thing. Right. Because it's, a, it's pointless. It's like, sometimes I say, sorry, I don't want to preach to you right now. Oh, you but, can. <laughs> very, I mean, if I'm attending a whole bunch of churches to get preached to, so. The thing is, you know, we're, it's like our lives are a big landscape. And the landscape, you know, there's some sunny patches, there's some swamp patches, there's some darkness, it's dark caves, there's beautiful meadows, and we have a tent. And we can, we can, you know, pitch our tent wherever we want. But we can decide to pitch our tent in the beautiful meadow with the trees, or we can decide to pitch our tent in the swamp. Mm -hmm. It's our choice. Interesting. And yeah, we're, so we're talking about church life and uh, basically the dynamics that go on inside a church. So when you, when you become became a priest, um, you obviously know that there are more men, men priests than women priests. Um, and I'm wondering what your opinion would be around like uh, women in pastorship roles or women in, in priest roles. Like, well, could we, like, I would like there to be more women in, in that particular role just for the sake of you know having more accessibility to you know see how a, a female priest or pastor would would, would uh, present that were you did you have to wrestle with that or something? yeah not at all um first of all you're in luck because um, at least in the anglican seminary right now it's half and half interesting yeah. so uh, more and more women are being drawn into it which is not surprising because in our society um empathy and love and service seem to be pushed into the female side of things right now. Right. So it's it's not manly to be empathetic. 
it's not manly to love or to study. It's manly to go out there and shoot things, you know? So, tough love yeah. yeah. So we don't have that many men who, well, we do have a lot of gay guys come into the, go into the church because okay. it's more allowed for a gay guy to uh, have that, those feelings. Uh, cis men, uh, cis um, heterosexual men uh, will probably uh, really need a big kick in our in the rear end from God to go into the to go into ministry. Not to say that they don't get it because they do, um, but in in general, women are more allowed to exhibit those qualities that are very helpful in the priesthood or in the ministry. So that's why women are are more maybe drawn to. I, I can't speak to Romans because I don't really know much about the Roman Catholic Church, um, but certainly with. Uh, with Anglicanism. Um, the big battle in the Ang in Montreal Diocese and the Anglican Church of Canada was in the 70s. Um, that's when women, 78, is when women were, uh, began, began to be priesthood in our communion uh, here in Canada. I was going to ask, like, because I just wanted to know like, on the timeline where that actually started. So. Yeah, in the 70s. In the 70s. Uh, so I, I missed out on that battle. I was far away from the church at that point, but a lot of our firebrands, Letty, Letty James was the first woman ordained in, Mon in Montreal Diocese. Whoa, she was a tiger. She died recently, last year, I think. She was a tiger. She was in her 90s and still as much a firebrand as ever. So it took women like that to really kick down some of the barriers. I don't have it within me for that kind of contention, but I don't have to because it was already done. There was no question about me being um, a priest and a woman at the same time. Um, I was a teacher for many years, so uh, my, I'm comfortable with authority. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I taught adults, so I didn't teach children ever at all. So I taught adults, so I'm comfortable with that kind of a authority over my peers. Right. So when I came into the ministry, I had that. I didn't have to worry. I didn't have to think, oh, I'm just a little lady. <laughs> um, people try to uh, kind of pro uh, uh, project that onto me, but I don't care. You know, I'm not defensive at all. Right. I don't have to be defensive. And you know who you are, and that's that's the test of character when a man or a woman, when, when they know who they are and what the limits of their authority is without getting out of place. Like, that's that's a test of character. That's when we know that, okay, here's where we're actually mature, mm -hmm. and we know how to set our foot down when, when it comes to saying what we want to say. Yeah, that's not a big deal for me, although it's annoying. I mean, I had a student not too long ago, and he was, uh, I guess, a little, a fair amount younger than me. He was in his 40s or early 50s. And he was a student, one of my students, he was a seminary student. So I always stand outside my church before the service starts and greet people as they come in. So there was Jeffrey standing next to me. And he's, he's got what I always call, I hope this is okay, I always say, he's got a dick and a beard. Right. So yeah, you yeah. Want to be, I, mean, I, I swear on the podcast all okay, the time. So, so it's, uh, it's very helpful if you have a dick and a beard if you want to be a priest. Right. Uh, so he has those two things. Sure. Um, I have the beard, but not the dick. Um, anyway, so I'm standing there in my in my, you know, vested up. Right. And he's standing there, he's not vested because he's not a priest, but he's got his, he's got an arm on. So people invariably, not my people who know me, but people would come in and, oh, hello, and they kind of glance past me, they're focused on my student, because he's a man, that expectation. And people will say to me, oh, are you, they find out I'm a priest at St. Thomas, he's, oh, are you, are you the only priest? And I said, yes. And they say, oh, so there's just one priest. And I'd like to have an assistant, but I don't have one. But their assumption being that I must be the assistant. There must be a, a one someone with a dick and a beard who's higher than me. Mm -hmm. Or people who will say, oh, are you interested in children's ministry? No, I'm very awkward around children. I've had three of them my, myself, but I'm awkward around kids. And it's not part of my skill set. So, But the assumption is I'm a woman, so I must be looking to children's ministry somehow. But I mean, I shrug those things off because it's just such minute importance in what I see as my role that it doesn't really bother me. That's, I mean, that's, it's great to have that uh, um, shield, you know, against all these different uh, prejudices that may, that may be bothersome, you know, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't consider myself a feminist at all like in, in, my, in my own perspective, especially not in modern day um, feminists and in today's sense of the word with, with 
what it brings to the table. Mm -hmm. um, but I do advocate for gender equality on all fronts. Like, you know, I've always told myself that, you know, I don't have kids now, right? I'm not even married or anything. Uh, but if I'm going to have kids one day, boys and girls, like, I'm definitely going to put my girls into wrestling or something that's, that's tough because I don't want them to think, oh, well, because my girl, I can't do mixed martial arts or boxing or wrestling or, mm -hmm. or something that's, you know, tough and tumble, you know? Mm -hmm. So I've always had that mentality where, you know, I personally don't care if the woman, uh, the, the person uh, at the front, uh, at the pulpit, if it's a woman or a man. Like, I've always thought, you know, I'll, I'll go to whatever church that teaches me the word. Mm. Because at the end of the day, they can both do the job properly. Like, mm. And I've had conversations with some of my more uh, evangelical friends uh, that have said that, like, in our church, we don't ordain women to be pastors. I'm like, okay, well, why exactly? Is, is, did Paul say something about that? Like, did Paul say that, oh, well, it, it is not good for a woman to not just working. be in Paul? <laughs> right, so I don't even know if it's it's probably I don't know which letter it is because not yeah, all the epistles are written by Paul. It's written in about a hundred years after Paul, and it was because a lot of people there were a lot of Paul did say something about women in churches, but you have to remember that Paul's letters are all specific for a particular context. Right. He wasn't except for the, the letter to the Romans that was more general. But his letters were you know there's some women that were making a kicking up a big fuss and taking on a lot of of their own ego into the church which still happens I hate to say it still happens so paul was just saying you know you should shut up you guys <laughs> you particular guys should shut up which is what loud mouths yeah those loud, loud mouths mouth. wanting to take all the attention off the word of god and onto their own selves and the way they see things could be men could be women a lot of people like that in the world but paul was talking to those particular people and giving them mm -hmm. an earful so i mean to take that Paul was, I mean, his fellow, he had fellow ministers that were women, like Lydia, the church, and Lydia, the church. If you read his letters, he's always greeting the church in this, that, or the other place, and there's women's names and all of that. It's it's ridiculous to think that, you know, Paul was anti-women. Of course, 100 years later, when the patriarchy came down with a with a hobnail boot on the, the, the church, I mean, Paul was the one that says there was no male, there was no female, there was no slave, there was no free. Uh, but people conveniently forget that because Timothy says, oh, women should not be teachers. Because at that time, again, they were being put under this, the patriarchy. Uh, so you, know, you have to look a little bit more carefully into scripture before you start making these pronouncements. I mean, in that case, you know what? I'm never going to go to a Tim Hortons ever again <laughs> because there was a Timothy there. <laughs> no. Timothy Hortons. So, Timothy Hortons. And uh, yeah, because he purported something something very sexist over there, I'm not having another Tim Hortons coffee. Oh, well, yeah. Obviously, I'm joking. Yeah. But because uh, I just can't, I can't stop going to Tim Hortons for something because I have to. Yeah, coffee I don't morning. like Tim Hortons. I don't so, like the coffee. It has nothing uh, to do with me. I'm kind of like, you know, stuck in that rut. So no, yeah. You know. But yeah, I mean, um, that, that's the thing. So I, I think they have theological reasonings as to why they can't ordain women. And what surprised me even more, whether it be on the Catholic side, especially the, the traditional Catholic side, and uh, on the evangelical side, when I spoke to certain Catholic girls that are younger than I'm 28, mm -hmm. they're girls that are like 25, 26, 27. And I tried to like, you know, give them the bait regarding women in, in priest roles. Mm -hmm. They were telling me no. Of course they, not. I'm like, glad I mean, you brought that up. Like, that, I'm glad you brought that up. And as a man, I just can't <laughs> wrap my head around what goes on in their mind. Like, my dear. I'm giving you the opportunity on a silver platter. Like, hey, if you're ever, if you ever want to be a priest, they, what they're thinking about is who's going to be in the pulpit with them in the congregation. And they want a guy. Because in a lot of, especially young women, it's like, Jesus is my boyfriend. Okay. And so, Jesus is my boyfriend, and the priest stands in, in place of Jesus, so he's got to be a guy, so he can be my boyfriend. Oh, I see, okay. And even in these older ladies that flutter around the male priests and bring them cookies and do that, yeah. it's still the idea of Jesus is my boyfriend. And that in persona Christi priest is acting as if he's yeah, Jesus. Yeah, because so I can love him with impunity, <laughs> especially if these poor, these poor ladies who don't have anyone to love them, you know, they don't, their husbands are long gone, and, and you know, their, their sons are distant. They just want a male love. 
Interesting. And there's the priest. I've never seen it that way. Yeah, it's because you're a guy. Yeah, because I don't think we can. But, you know, as me, I get up there in the pulpit, and I have a very different dynamic with the ladies in my congregation. Very, very different. They see me as a fellow woman, which is perfect. I am. And it takes them a little while to accept my authority, because why should I be up in a pity? Because they're women, too, and how dare I stand up there and you know, tell them what to do. Oh, I'm, I'm a fellow woman, which is true. So I have to, in that sense, I love it, because my authority can't come from something outside or something that's not, that I have no control over. I am a woman, you know, that's it. I got a vagina, I have tits, I, I'm up there, same as them. They can't project any of that other stuff on me. So they, I have to dig deep into my own sense of my own calling to get them from a different direction. You see, because I would, just from this particular story that you're telling, like I would be tempted to think the exact opposite, where like since you're obviously a woman, women would gravitate more toward a woman, woman that would resemble them and their traits and whatnot, and not go towards a man if they don't have to. <laughs> you know, we all love to put our priests on a pedestal. And it's easier to put for a woman to put a man on the pedestal and love them yeah. rather than a fellow woman who's going to be like, I know where you're coming from. You know, oh, how dare you think that you have something higher than me? No, of course you don't. It's just, it's normal. And I think with with male priests, with the men in their congregation, it's probably a similar dynamic that women will be far more. Oh yes, father. Oh yes, father. Where's the guys are going to say? Who you think you are? But I don't know. You're a man with a male priest. How do you feel about your priest? Uh, I mean, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, like I don't really like the 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 gender of the individual at the pulpit does not bother me in whatsoever. Sometimes I may disagree a little bit more with just from experience. I disagreed with uh, with women more than I disagreed with with what men had to say. Like I'll, I'll give you a case in point. Uh, there was what this one. Anglican priest in I think Dollar Zimmer, I don't remember the church his name. Uh, it's near it's near the Lutheran church there and near near Pastor Slack's uh, okay. church. I don't remember. It, it's an Indian priest. She, she's an Indian priest. Oh, Dorothy Samuel. Right, and uh, I went to her service once and we shook hands afterwards. It was fun, but there was one thing that she did in her tr uh, service that I disagreed with was to bring a social cause during the liturgy and I think that's probably due to a Catholic upbringing where we kind of separate um, but we try to focus on Christ and Christ's message and not bring Black Lives Matter to the forefront right and I, I don't mind talking about Black Lives Matter but not in the bloody middle of, of a service okay. so uh, for me the the localization of that particular cause in the service kind of bothered me okay. mm -hmm. I would have kept that to the end mm -hmm. or perhaps like downstairs in the, the common lobby or whatever but not in the service. So that's one thing that like a female priest did, but I guess if it were a guy that, that, that did that, it would have bothered me just as much. It's just that by, from experience, there was one thing that, that bothered me in that case, but- um, And you attached it onto the fact that she was a woman. No, 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 I- You just said It's that just that was I, a reason. The circumstances were as such, okay. and you know, when I look at the, the apples and oranges, you know, it's kind of unfortunate certainly fell onto a female, right? Yeah, because it could have been a guy. Right, that. right, yeah, I do totally acknowledge that. It's just that it happened to be a woman that did that. So that's one thing, but other than that, I don't have any beef with if it's a guy or, I don't mind, I just don't mind. Um, I, even, even for a spiritual director, like right now it's it, it's a guy, mm -hmm. and, but if, if it were a woman, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want it, like obviously not. Like, I would be... Okay, well, everybody has, each person has different whether they be male, female, sometimes the, their their gender is part of their gifts, and sometimes it's kind of irrelevant to their gifts. Um, and it depends. That's also as far as far as spiritual direction goes. Also, that's uh, part of the. There has to be chemistry in the spiritual direction. And sometimes for some people, they just cannot get past the gender. Not you, because obviously you've had experience with both. But for a lot of people, they'll just categorically say, I want a male spiritual director, or I want a woman spiritual director. And anything else will be a problem for them, notwithstanding the gifts that that particular spiritual director can give, but that's okay. And even right now, like I do, I have several jobs outside of Concordia. So I work for Concordia. I have like two particular jobs at Concordia during my master's, but I also have jobs in tutoring and marketing outside. And oftentimes in tutoring, um, we do have like profiling, um, 
characteristics that are very explicit. Like, let's say the kid wants a female tutor, like strictly a female tutor, whether it be a boy or a girl, mm -hmm. and that kind of like discriminates against me because oftentimes they want females rather than, than males. So I'm like, okay, well, he's out of my pool. So like, okay, well, who, who's next? But you know, and sometimes I lost contracts with with kids because the parents were like, ah, you know what? We're, we're gonna go with a we're gonna go with a female tutor because we prefer that approach. Oh, okay, well, fine. Mm -hmm. So you know, just to draw an analogy with spiritual directors, like some people would prefer, and obviously everybody's that freedom to choose mm -hmm. whatever they want. It's just that it, it's better to be open to like. And a lot of a lot of congregations will specify that they don't want a woman priest or they don't want a man priest. It's okay. I'm not going to push that envelope because honestly, I don't want to waste energy on it. Um, if if it were life and death, of course, I'll you know, get out there and say, you know, how stupid can you be? But uh, in general, I'm no skin off my nose. They don't want me. They don't have to have me. It's okay. Right. Well, whereas other people, other women, w would be bothered by that, right? It's possible. Right. I, I would say even highly likely that you know, oh, okay, well, because I'm a woman, blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. So you know, and I do understand. I empathize with that because, again, like, <laughs> I think opportunities should be open for everybody. Like, whether, whether it be engineering or football or yes. or ballet or whatever, like, it's it should be pretty much across the board. Um, so, you know, I, I looked at, um, I watched a video that, that Madden sent me, I think it was a, some sort of instructor video, like you t touring people around. Uh, yeah, it was that yeah, video, so, my shoes. Right, and that kind of introduced me to, to a little bit of who you were in, in, that, in that sense. Um, so, you, you mentioned that the, the church is kind of like dying off a little bit slowly, you know, mm -hmm. but surely. Uh, and we, you know, I did ask about like a revival in that sense, but for your church particularly, is, is there is there hope at the end of the line? Like, is there, is there hope? Um, I think that yes and no. I think people in general, young people in general, are big lacks and have a lot of young people, um, and young people have a real um, a real distrust of not just the church but of, of any kind of an institution. Mm -hmm. So this uh, and it does see uh, itself manifested in the church. This church is a big institution. But in, especially in Quebec, we're now third generation non-church. Interesting. Yes, so it's, the, it's not my parents went to church, so I'm going to rebel. It's my grandparents went to church. Right. Like my parents never went to church. And in some sense, there's a kind of a of an interest of curiosity, a curiosity about church or about spirituality, Christian spirituality, that's now in third generation. So as far as as church people coming together to study the word of, of God or to follow the, the way of Jesus, the way of Jesus is now completely counterculture. Mm -hmm. And young people are drawn to like challenge the status quo. And Christianity challenges the status quo. So I can see in that in that sense hope coming through. But maybe not the way the church looks like now. It might be looking in a very different way, but as far as being hopeful about the idea of people coming together to worship God and to serve each other, yeah, obviously, mm -hmm. yes, but it may not look like our churches at the present. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to say that everything is doom and gloom when I'm looking at the future, if, if I had a, a microscope to, to see what was, what was actually going on here, but I, I do feel like we're getting further and further away from, from God. And, um, I mean, one, one of these, uh, a theologian by the name of Christopher West, not sure if you know who that is, he's a Catholic theologian who um, wrote a lot about John Paul II and like, that kind of thing. He said we're living in a post-Christian era, and I have to agree, we are living, like I, I would call that the fourth schism, like after every like every 500 years now that we're at the, the third one, um, or fourth one, you know, we, I feel like, we, yeah, we are living in a, in a post-Christian era because we're not heralding the, the the Christian ideals like we used to before. You're talking about North America. Mostly, I would yeah. say mostly North because America. everywhere else in the world, it was a, a really a, a very much a going concern Christianity. Right. Very much a going concern in Africa, in South America. Right. There, there is, I mean, you know, Pentecostalism is blossoming a lot in, in South America and in Africa, and now I've never been to South America or extensively to Africa other than one way over. Um, I've been to Europe and uh, particularly Poland, uh, France, Portugal, Spain, and Italy. Like, those are the main ones plus other countries. I feel like the, the, this, the, 
the Christianity seems to be a little bit more in the air in, in mm -hmm. Europe. More than in North America? Well, uh, it depends on where in North America, of course. You know, Quebec is, is very secular. It's like written into our laws to be secular. Yeah. So that's a, a very different uh, different idea. But I think, you know, we have to be careful about making assumptions about Christianity according to our own very particular circumstances. So we live in what seems like the, just a normal, natural way. Um, our way of being Christian is, is just like the way everybody is. But if you step outside that bubble, you'll see that there's a very different world out there. I do a lot of travel. I travel a lot. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I love about traveling is just to see how spirituality is manifested in different places. Right. Like, I love India so much. And why was I so, um, I find Hinduism so appealing and not Islam, is because Hinduism, for example, is incarnational. And I'm an incarnational girl. Mm -hmm. So the idea of, of human uh, and, and wholeness and humanity coming together is very appealing to me. But it, when you say incarnation, it's not reincarnation? No, it's, okay, just no. incarnation. Okay. Uh, the deity taking on flesh, mm -hmm. which happens in Hinduism. Yes, they have reincarnations. I'm not talking about that. Um, it's the idea of the holy being manifest, like Ram coming into the world as a human being, and uh, Krishna, you know, and uh, all of these kind of, I mean, there's stories, but they're more than stories, like scripture is. And that idea is, is appealing, just, just to see how people really connect with spirituality is fascinating, because sometimes we get the idea that the only way that people can connect with spirituality is that we connect with spirituality, and anything else is kind of weird and foreign and, and wrong. But, you know, you only have to do a little bit of travel to figure out that we are only like a little common drop in the ocean. Right. right. And I started traveling a couple of years ago, because before that, obviously, I was studying, didn't have much money in that, that kind of thing. But when I started really traveling, I really developed a passion and a love for traveling because I, I can't not go a year or I can't go a year without without traveling. Right? It's, it's, it's just such an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. Like last summer, I was in um, in Thailand, mm. and I was really impressed by the level of piety that Buddhists have for the Buddha, the, the Buddha, right? Not just Buddha, the, mm -hmm. and just like from, there were so many temples, and you, you can cross the street, go, you know, walk on up down a boulevard and go to each one of those shrines, and you'd see the level of, of piety, people on their knees praying to Buddha and um, practicing the religion in, in such a uh, admirable way, and uh, you know, despite our religious differences, you know, me being a Christian, Thai people being Buddhist, mm -hmm. I saw that common denominator, that, that commonality where, you know, piety is, is such an important thing. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if you've been to India, like, is, is there any other country, like, uh, what, what would be, like, your top countries? Or, no, I love like, India, as I said. Um, uh, oh, gosh. I just came back from Sicily. I go, okay, I've been to Rome. Been to the I haven't been to Rome. No, I was in Vatican. Texas, in Sicily. Uh, I don't know, Vietnam. I'm not a really, I don't find Buddhism that appealing. It's it's too cerebral to me. Interesting. Um, but the, it's just the way people manifest. Uh, when I went to Colombia and uh, in, also in Cuba where they have the Santeria, which is, and also in I see where you know they have the whole moon kind of manifestation, which I find very dark. That well, doesn't what is that voodoo. A voodoo, oh yeah. yeah. So I find in Centuria, um, I find those those expressions of spiritual quite dark. They don't appeal to me. But not to say that they're not valid ways of being. Thing is, spirituality is greater than humanity. Right. So when we, when we find ourselves drawn to the spiritual world, we find ourselves drawn to it in a way that's compatible with our own self. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's good, that's the way of doing it. Um, we can be informed by each other's connection with spirituality, but it, we don't have to adopt it. Mm -hmm. We can see it as, as enriching our own sense of spirituality, and that's what I find. Um, and I think that the, that's uh, when Rowan Williams talked about that. Did, did you ever read anything of Rowan Williams? Uh, no. You should Not read yet. Him. Christian theology. He's like brilliant man. He used to be the Arch Archbishop of Canterbury. 
you know, rig on laundry day or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we're not, we're not like we, oh, I read the I whole kicked, book. I kicked yeah. when I had to read laundry again, but at the end of reading it, he changed my way of thinking. Like, I didn't think that was a bad writer. I should have read, it, read him in the original French because his writing in English is, is so but he's, a, he's Irish, so he must be Anglophone, right? Mm-hmm. He's Irish, like Lonergan. Lonergan? Okay, when I'm home, I think he's born here. But yeah, he's, yeah, I, think, yeah, yeah, I think he's, yeah. his first language is, I think, is Oh, English. gosh, then you have no excuse. Why did I think he was? Oh, I'm thinking about something, someone completely different. Well, it might be him, but no, 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 he's a bad writer. Whatever, but his ideas were so life changing. Oh yeah, absolutely. For me. I, who's your teacher for Monday? Uh, Dr. Christine Jameson. Oh, Chris. You probably know her. I do know her. Yeah. I had Paul. Um, Paul, what's his last name? Oh gosh, it was on the tip of my tongue. Don't be, don't get old. I can't remember his name. Anyway, he taught me long again, and he had to listen to me bitching and complaining about it the whole semester. Because Freedom of expression. <laughs> But I, I, he changed my life. I love Lonergan. But if you get a chance to read uh, at some point, Rowan Williams on Christian, uh, it's either on theology or on Christian theology. I can't remember which one. That's, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. R- Rowan. Rowan uh, Williams. Uh, Rowan Williams. Interesting. So, oh no, 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 no sorry. <laughs> So I remember, yeah, so Rowan Williams, so he's, uh, and he's, is he coming from a particular denomination? He's Anglican, he used to be the, the Archbishop of Canterbury, so the, the highest of the Anglican Church, he's a poet. I met him, and he's such a sweet man. Anyway, so he's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. So get a chance, it's really very worthwhile reading. But what he said about, uh, he talked a lot about interfaith connections. And uh, what he said was, we are we are illuminated by each other's faiths. We don't have to adopt them, and we don't have to look for commonalities. We can allow ourselves to be illuminated without feeling fear that we're going to be submitted. Right, and I think you know the Catholic Church also, uh, I believe, you know, recently said that there are truths that exist outside of the Christian religion, like in Islam or in other faiths. You know, so, um, and that, that that that's very recent. Like the, I think the the church did this in the 2000s, really, really recently. Um, and now, when it comes to Anglican authors, obviously the first my, person that comes to mind is C.S. Lewis. Oh, yeah. Like, I absolutely, I, I've never, I've heard about C.S. Lewis a lot. I've never read anything. You've never from, read the children's books? Well, I watched Narnia when I was a kid, okay. so that was Close pretty enough. much it. Close so. enough. No, but, Jack Lewis, he's, he also, he was one of my, I have these spiritual people that have come into my life uh, throughout my life. And, uh, Jack Lewis was one of those people and in my earliest childhood like he was writing them when I was a child so I read them and yeah it really informed my sense of God and the sense of how God could be perceived by people so yeah it's worthwhile reading, reading them although you know he's been dead for a while now so uh, some of the things he said you have to put yourself in the mindset of you know, several decades ago but that's Jack Lewis. Oh, he called himself Jack. I thought, oh, it's C.S. 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 Oh. He, C.S. Okay. Lewis and Clive Staple Lewis. No Clive. one ever called him anything but Jack. Jack, really? So, so, because I've read a lot about him. So it's funny that we don't call him or we don't refer to him as Jack. If his contemporaries actually did, so it's. Uh, oh yeah, everybody did. It's just that his he his official name. He was. It's an interesting story because um, when he was a little boy. His name was Clive Staples Lewis, and they taught him, called him Clive, his parents, but he absolutely insisted that they had a dog named Jackie, and he insisted that he would he be called Jackie. Yeah, after and, his dog. Yeah, after his dog, and that was it. For his whole life, he was Jack Lewis. That's, that's pretty interesting, because what I do recall from Jack C.S. Lewis <laughs> is... You can just call him Lewis, it's okay. Lewis, <laughs> Lewis yeah. Uh, not Lewis Hamilton, but uh, that's another story. <laughs> yeah. um, is, is a couple of his teachings, like not exactly his, his fiction or his writings per se, but some things that, some morals or some knowledge that mm-hmm. I drew out of his thought, like, um, uh, what was one of them? It was, is, was it him that said that uh, knowledge without faith, or if faith doesn't build upon nature, um, then we're only building a bigger demon mm-hmm. or something. I'm, I'm really butchering it, but it's something along the lines of uh, like building Faith. Well, I know that Thomas Aquinas was the one who talked about building faith on top of reason, but I think he, he said something like, reason without faith 
uh, just makes a stronger demon. Meaning that if people only focus on the intellectual and the, the on knowledge mm -hmm. without having a sense of spirituality and faith and religion, then the outcome or output in this case would be a person who could definitely be uh, tremendously evil. And we can think about the Nazis, for example. They had, you know, the the, the most striving technological advances, uh, some of the brightest scientists in the world. But obviously, they were evil, mm -hmm. right? So, um, yeah. So I, th I think you know, C.S. Lewis, that particular datum from C.S. Lewis really stuck with me. Yeah. Interesting. I don't. I don't. Remember, I'm not saying it's not true, but I don't remember that. Yeah, it's I think human beings. You know, we all we can always make a choice. And our choices are often self-serving and self-deceptive. And that can be with or without logic. I mean, you can be the most logical person in the world and still be drawn to a sense of spirituality, which is not, it's, it's not against your logic, it's just in tandem with it. Mm -hmm. Or you can be someone who's like pulled by their emotions and their feelings and still make bad choices. So I don't think it's like, necessarily one is contingent on the other. I can definitely speak for my generation. There is that quest for spirituality, but the the trendy thing to say is that I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual, or I'm <laughs> spiritual, not religious, which, which to me seems oxymoronic because, you know, you can't really have one without the other. Well, of course you can. You can have spirituality. With, you can have religion without spirituality. You see lots of people like that, right. sitting in the, chew, in, the, in the pews, they've got their ticket to heaven, but they have the spiritual bone in their body. Like the, the Kenneth Copelands of the world? Or... Mm, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's ironic. The, people, the thing that, that your generation always makes me smile is they talk about the universe. Yeah, the, instead of God. If yes. the universe wants, or I'm going to throw it out into the universe, and I'm thinking, what's the universe to you? It's, it's very new age. Yeah, and... but it's, it's God. It's just another right. word for God. But they're acting as if it was somehow a higher, higher than God, you know, the universe. Yeah, no, that they want to rebuke or reject God because mm -hmm. of particular teachings. Yes, of course, but they still have the God's laws written in their heart, as we all do as right. human beings, so they have to use a different language. Yeah. That's okay, it's, it's kind of cute. It is, for sure, and you know, when we look at, you know, the, the, the today's generation, you know, generation Y and Z, and, and the common trends and social movements that are going on, social justice, that kind of thing, um, oftentimes we see the relationship between, let's say, the LGBTQ community and which I am not part of or I don't, I don't know much about, um, and uh, the Anglican Church, right? Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of my Catholic friends said, hey, well, Chris, did you notice that this or that Anglican Church may have a, a rainbow flag in the, in the church or whatever? Um, I wonder what your stance would be regarding all these things that are ever juggling with. Everybody, as I said, everybody has God's love in their heart. Everybody's built as a spiritual being. And how they, I mean, our society is just, I did my, for, to put this in context, I did my last final paper in my master's degree on homosexuality in the Anglican communion. So I did a lot of research on it. Uh, but of course that was, I, I got my degree in 2006, so we're talking about a long time ago. Um, I think that that it's a, it's a non-issue. Our society is is sex obsessed. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. And identi identifying ourselves according to who we want to go to bed with is something that's that's very new, very contemporary. Mm -hmm. People, there's always homosexuality, um, but it was never part of people's identity. It wasn't who they were. It was what they did. Right. So, yeah. um, because it has become part of our identity, and it's Michel Foucault, maybe that's what I'm thinking about reading in French. Yeah. Michel Foucault um, and his, his history of sexuality, or whatever it was that he wrote, the book, big book that he wrote on, on sexuality, he made that, he made that very interesting uh, observation that uh, before, I think, the 1800s, there were people who were, of course, um, in a, in a, marriage but we're just you know having sex with other people of the same sex nobody really thought about it too much it's like a lot of people in africa say well our uh, our society has no homosexuality or like kenya for example they have a stance against that yeah it doesn't mean that there's no homosexuals in that it, it means that they're also married to women so it's okay mm -hmm. 
the social, the social aspect of being man, woman in a in a marriage, bearing children, is the thing that trumps everything. What they do on their own is of no consequence. If they're trying to live with another person of the same sex as if it were a marriage, that's where the problem comes in their society. Here we don't have that problem. We have, you know, you can live with uh, with someone of the of the same sex in a marriage, and you no know, one worries too much about it. The church, why does the church get involved with who people want to sleep with? I don't, I don't really understand. Um, I, what I, I know there are a lot of uh, gay clergy in Montreal. And I really like one of my friends uh, is, a, is a gay priest and he's married to his husband. And when he came into our diocese, they were not married. They were living together and our bishop sat him down and said to him, you know, Jim, in our diocese, you have to be married. You can't be living with a partner. So you have to get married. But, but he can't be like I know that there was celibacy in the for, for Catholics. For some wondering if there is that notion of celibacy for Anglican priests or some of them. There's only diocese. Our diocese, no. Uh, we have a lot of those gay people in our clergy people, but they have they can't be living with their partners. They have to be married, whether they're hetero or or whether they're gay or heter heterosexual. You can't be just living chapped up. You have to be married. Yeah. So he had to marry his his boyfriend. And he can his husband. So that he could be, so that's our diocese. But I know it's different everywhere. It's all right. Right, and even like when I look at different denominations, like different people are going to say different things. Like for some people are more, you know, staunchly against, for instance, homosexuality or just the, the whole uh, amalgamation of LGBTQ um, groups or subgroups rather, uh, and you know, the, the different. You know that this particular movement is attacked or looked at um, through different lenses. You know, with different levels of severity. You know, some um, I, I know some some people who are going to have like a lot of uh, bad things to say about that particular community, and you know, I, I don't think it's necessarily intentional, or perhaps it's uh, it's either coming from ignorance or judgment, or maybe even a sense of knowing right from wrong in their own views, and, and that kind of like. Tampers with their, their yeah, of course. speech. So. Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, people have a lot of reasons for prejudice. Right. Uh, so it manifests itself as being not um, and as evil rather than distasteful. There's a lot of journeyman wrote a book too called Sex, Dirt, something else. I can't remember the title. I'm bad at titles. Anyway, he wrote uh, that a lot of people find homosexuality icky. For themselves like they wouldn't ever do that and so they find it icky so rather than saying "Ooh, you're, you're kissing another man or you're kissing another woman that's icky rather than saying that they'll say that's sinful mm -hmm. they project outward yeah they use a theological jargon to, to label that and yeah like you know i i can't really speak for these people because you know i'm i know that i'm heterosexual i know what i'm attracted to mm -hmm. uh but i've had i've known gay people i've had a gay boss in the, in the past and I'm never afraid to talk to them about it, just to you know pick their brains and understand. Okay, well, from their homosexual point of view, how do they view life, and how do they view like their just society and, and their own individual lifestyle? Mm -hmm. And they would explain to me like why exactly they're they're gay and or, or what how how they are oriented. Even though it's for me, it's hard to understand. It's just hard. But I'm trying my best as irkingly as possible to put myself in their shoes and to understand, like, how, how does a homosexual view life? Well, right? I mean, who you sleep with. Uh, the thing is, the idea of, of um, sexuality is such a broad spectrum. To divide things into, like, homo and heterosexuality is, is simplifying things a right. lot. You know, there's lots of people in a sexual relationship that other people wouldn't. I mean, they have the whole list of them now. Uh, demisexuals, um, I don't know what they're Queer, called. bisexual. Yeah, queer, bisexual, um, bi, uh, what is it? Um, cis, trans, I guess. Oh yeah, cis, trans. Um, all of those things are just a different way of putting people into smaller and smaller categories. But honestly, who you're attracted to sexually is such a small part of of life in general, except in our society now, it's a huge, big thing. Right, right. It's only in our society now. Right. So, um, as far as trying to understand, I mean, some some people in this, I'm like, I'm I'm a cis het woman. I'm I'm happy in my being a woman, and I'm heterosexual, 
Um, but I don't really worry too much about what anyone else is doing. You know, it's, it's up to them. Like I know people who have foot fetishes. I can't imagine a foot fetish. I don't care, you know, they let them do them, you know? So um, it's not an issue, it's not an important issue. And it's like saying, uh, oh, you were born with red hair. Oh, no, you tell me what it's like to be born with red hair. I'm like, who cares? Yeah, that's a different character. Like pigmentation or hair melanin or whatever. It's, it becomes very, uh, like, I mean, Wait, oh, how 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 is it to be to be black? <laughs> well, that kind of thing. Yeah, so, no, it's or, like it's it's not these are not things that people choose, right? It's 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 very. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's other issues that are way more important than that. So I mean, it's interesting in the, in the sense that people uh, develop an identity around it. Right. And that is that's more important. So if people are feeling like they're the only gay person in the world, and then they find a community. I follow on YouTube. I follow this trans man. Uh, Jamie Rains, and he's just, he's really uh, opened my eyes, I mean, he's, he's not there to, like, instruct everybody what it means to be trans, but he certainly um, allowed me to see uh, society, I, I, I knew a few trans people, but I didn't really think about it too much, but, you know, so the idea of having a society of what does it mean to be um, a person that is different from other people, and how important it is for those uh, for people who feel like ostracized to have a core group that they can connect with and feel and feel um, upheld by. So when you see uh, LGBTQ uh, plus people saying, you know, we need to be seen in the church, then that I can say, yeah, I can come. When I moved to St. Thomas, when I came to St. Thomas, everyone told me, oh, conservative, they're super, super conservative, they're anti-gay, blah, blah, blah. I come from a very liberal background. So I said to them, at one point, our, our bishop said, well, um, you can open your churches to same-sex blessings as long as the priest is in favor and the congregation is in favor. So obviously I'm in favor. So I said to them, I said, I said um, I'm going to do a, um, a secret ballot. And the question is, are we going to allow same-sex blessings in St. Thomas Church? And I said, no discussion. I don't want to talk about it. You guys have been talking about it for years. You already have your opinion. Uh, we don't have to discuss it. Nobody has to get up on their soapbox and say yes or no. You've already made your decision. I just want to know what's in your heart. Mm -hmm. So we did that. And 80% uh, for in favor of same-sex, uh, of having same-sex buds in our church. It's never come up, unfortunately, but they're in favor of it. And this is in a group of people that everyone told me were super conservative, very reactionary. It's because the people who were so super conservative had big mouths. Mm -hmm. And everybody else was just kind of oh, like too big mouths. And then... So, you know, it's, and I'm glad that that, that they, I was very gratified that they came out in favor of this because, you know, at a Christian church saying, no, you can't come in because who you're sleeping with? Right. Like, coming, yeah, my, I think my issue personally is when you're preventing someone a human being from coming into church for whatever trait or yes. characteristic that they're carrying, I think that's that's absolutely wrong. Yeah, it's, now, it's obviously, demonic. That's absolutely. But when it comes to certain um, behaviors pertaining to, like, uh, whether it be sexual orientation or other characteristics, I obviously have my theological um, framework to evaluate that. You know, I'm, I'm not exactly... The most super conservative person that I that you meet, but not the super liberal person either. Like I'm, I'm very centrist okay. when I look at my ideas. Like I'm not, I don't, I don't lean left. I don't necessarily lean right. And for me to actually know that I'm at that place on the spectrum, I have to debate with folks on the left and folks on the right, and I find myself disagreeing with, with both, okay. and then realize, okay, well, I'm somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, so I do have theological, sorry, Mary. Is, uh, okay. I don't have anything to do with that. Yeah, so I do have my, my uh, theological points of view mm -hmm. when it comes to all these different issues, which a lot of people may disagree with. Mm -hmm. um, and when the time is right, I do discuss them and I, uh, I bring them out and set them on the table. So I'm like, hey, this is what I think theologically. And I, I agree with this, but I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. So I try to find like, both points of disagreements yeah. and agreement with people. Yeah, it's conflict is good.
again, yeah, <laughs> we go back to that point where it's That's a complex. True. We've had a lot of com conversations with people who are like adamantly opposed to my point of view, and you know, I, I, I enjoy com talking about them. They're not going to sway me, I'm not going to sway them. But you get a different perspective, and that's always good. So, yeah, I mean, for me, there's general human things that I think that people who harm each other, I don't like, whether you're in a, a gay relationship or a straight relationship. If you're hurting your partner, if you're not the safe place for your partner, then, then I think that that's wrong. Um, as far as, like for example, promiscuity, uh, both hetero and homosexuals are, can be promiscuous. And the, I mean, the, the longest uh, monogamous relationships I have myself experienced in, in my group of friends and acquaintances have been gay men. Interesting. For sure. okay. I would have thought the exact opposite, though. <laughs> but yeah, anyway. For sure. I can name like five couples that have never strayed from their relationship for 40 years. They've been strong, strong uh, monogamous couples. Of course, you know people of, of both genders. You know there's a big spectrum there. And uh, so but there's a lot of misconceptions. Um, so I think that we have, it behooves us. To look beyond their misconceptions, to, to inform ourselves rather than making assumptions according to very small pools of people. So, um, but I, I have, I had not so much now. Had many, many homosexual friends, many, which was one of the reasons why I, I did my paper on it, because I could see their experience, and I was one step uh, apart from that experience because I'm, I'm hetero myself, but I was able to kind of look at it from both sides. And uh, I mean, I think really informing oneself is, is really important. And everybody's different. You get two gays, two gay guys in a relationship, and their relationship is like this. Two other gay guys in a, in a relationship, and their relationship is completely different, just like hetero people. You know, you get a man and a woman in a marriage here, and a man and a woman in a marriage there. It's all, you know, they're coming together with each other's personalities. And Sex is really, sex is just sex. It's, it's a very complex uh, issue or, or subject to talk about, but yeah, I do agree that a lot of um, differences exist within the particular orientation per se. Like it's, um, you know, if we, if we look at, you know, heterosexual couples, like the dynamic between uh, man and woman in one couple is going to be different in another couple. That's always like we, it's not a one size fits all type of yeah, protocol exactly. that people follow, you know. So, and the same with gay relationships, right? Same thing with the you know, whether it be lesbians or gays and that kind of thing. So, it's very interesting that you wrote your, your last paper on homosexuality and your human strengths. So, when you did your master's here, was it project or thesis? Or it was not thesis, it was uh, because I didn't have any background in theology. Um, I did more course, coursework, right. so I did, but I had to do a big paper. It wasn't a thesis, it was a big paper, um, and so that's what I chose to do it on. Um, but no, I didn't do a thesis. I never wanted to go on into a doctorate. I'm, I don't like research. So, um, and that was, I wanted to be a priest at that point in my, you know, I just wanted to be a parish priest. So right. I didn't think that I had to be doctor qualified. Master. Some people put like all the different titles, like doctor, reverend, whatever, MBA. Reverend whatever. doctor, so and so. Well, I, I'm, I'm kind of guilty because you know I put the BSc after my name because I'm also not from a theology uh, undergrad. I did my bachelor's degree in biochemistry at Concordia, but over on at uh, Loyola campus, okay. so that the Jesuit campus down there. Mm -hmm. And you know, it took me about three years between graduation and. My, the, the, the start of my master's to actually think things out. And I did a couple of business courses because I thought I was going to do an MBA, but applied, got refused. So it was kind of like a, in a weird spot where I had to like choose. I, I knew I wanted to do graduate studies. It's just that, and I, I do want to teach later on. I do want to be a professor. So I'm looking at PhD options. Of course. But uh, I wasn't sure what master's I was going to do. I was very versatile. So I, I tend to dabble a lot in different fields. Like I creative writing, entrepreneurship, business, marketing. I work in marketing, I've worked in sales a couple of years, very successful at that, but I knew that, you know, professorship in academia was, was where I needed to go mm -hmm. at that point. So then, you know, lo and behold, I just randomly apply, put a hundred bucks and bet on myself for an MA in theology. And they're like, okay, yeah, we like, we like your profile. Your McGill grades were good because I went to McGill for two years between my bachelor's and my master's. Mm -hmm. 
And they're like, yeah, we, we're going to take you in. Well, I, I've taken one theology elective in my bachelor's as, an, as a general education course, New Testament with Matthew Anderson. And then they're like, yeah, but we're going to have to put you through a couple courses, but then you Yeah, got a little concordance. Right. And I started off course-based project, um, but then given the legalities of what I wanted to do, like interviewing pastors and priests and that kind of thing, um, I decided to drop the project and I'm now I'm focusing on my thesis. Um, and what's really interesting about my thesis is that it's very comparative because mm -hmm. it's, it's a comparative study between uh, Roman Catholics and Evangelicals okay. on eschatology and ah. I look at how that tr their views translate into politics and society. Let me know when you're finished, I'd like to read it. Yeah, I gotta get started though. <laughs> so right. no that's time limit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the summer's rolling around, so that's my prime focus because all the courses are done. Like, I took all the, the basics and. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, all the foundations are, are in the in the books, but um, but yeah, like so, so you, you took course course base and um, you knew that you wanted to be a priest, but you, yeah, were... not until I was halfway through. Right. I started. Um, I was in my church, and one of my one of my fellow parishioners said, my home church, he says, you know, Carlo, you've got to take a course in theology. And I don't want to take. Yeah, you got it. Promise me you're going to take a course in theology. We went to McGill Summer, their summer program, and I took peace and war and peace or something and Christian. And um, and I, I really got into it. I really enjoyed the course. And so I thought, oh, I was going to take another course in theology. I went to Concordia because I got, because I was a professor here, I got free courses. So right. I could go to Concordia. And I talked to Pamela Bright. I don't know. She's, she's, I heard the name. Yeah, sure Pamela and, and Charles Conningisa. They were a married couple. He was used to be a Jesuit priest, and she was a nun. And well, oh yeah, I heard that story. Yeah, okay, yeah. and so the, they were the backbone of Concordia back when I was doing my theology degree. Anyway, I was talking to Pamela, and I explained that I thought I'd take a course. She says, oh, "Carl," she says, "You have to do a th you have to do a, th um, a master's in theology." Right. I said, "I don't know anything about theology." She says, "That's okay. You're going to take this, this, and this course here, and these courses in the summer, and you're going to start in your master's in September." So that's how I that's how I got in. Yeah, I got pulled in that way. Yeah, I got pulled in. Right. Not kicking, not kicking and screaming. I was really <laughs> very enthusiastic about it. But yeah, the the thing that that will happen at Concordia, whereas it would not have happened at McGill. And you taught here, and you taught at Sejet. Uh, yeah. The Zoom or, the Zoom yeah. Or? I taught English second language. I never. Oh, okay. So I was going to ask, like, if you, if you spoke in French at uh, Sejet, the Zoom or? Well, I had to do everything in, in French except right. my classes because, of course, you, you know, all the bureaucracy and all of the administration is in French there. We, all of the English teachers had to sit around and do our, uh, our departmental meetings in French, right. even though we're all English teachers. Yeah. Uh, that was just the way it was. So yeah, I did I did those things. So yeah, I got into I got into my my theology degree and kind of through the back door, but uh, never regretted it. And like I said, it was halfway through before I realized I wanted to be a priest. I didn't know why I was doing my my theology degree. I just knew I loved it. That's not your case, is it? If I love it? No, no. If you if your God's calling you to the priesthood. No, actually, well, funny enough, I got invited to a um, a vocational gathering type of event last week um, in, in, a, in the Catholic context and I met uh, Father Dominique Richet who talked about his, you know, he shared his testimonial about how he um, came to choose to be a priest and all that but I told him, you know, explicitly like I'm, in Ephesians 4.11 it, it clearly states five different roles that Christians play and the pastor role is not my role mm -hmm. like my role is the teacher role right. like, but there's a lot of that in yeah. the pastoring part so I really like, you know, my two favorite verses are actually in Ephesians for some reason. Like Ephesians six twelve, which is for for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against darkness and high places or whatever. And Ephesians four eleven is great because it really outlines the roles that we play, and we, we get to identify with those different roles. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you play more than one role, but like I knew that in those five in Ephesians four eleven, I was going to be a teacher. So I told him like explicitly, like, I'm not called to do this. Okay. Like, I'm not called to be a priest because, in in a in a weird sense, I don't think I'm holy enough to be a priest. <laughs> right? If I'm holy enough to be a priest, man. so, so I'm, there's that uh, sense of uh, accountability that I don't want to have when it comes to being a priest because well, a priest, you have to. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, but you have to remember who Jesus chose. 
Right. Right. Did he go to the synagogue and you know choose the yeah. holiest one, the one that knows? Yeah, certainly the Pharisee, the tax collector. Right. You know, uh, I think I, in the sense that I follow my Lord Jesus, uh, I know that that he's okay with who I am, and his choice of me is not because I'm so holy, I'm not particularly holy, um, but because I want to. Right. And he's quite happy to use me whatever way, and I'm happy with that too. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not holy. I'm not particularly holy. I try. I strive for holiness, as we all do. But um, I'm not naturally a holy person. You should see me when I'm driving. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh, I, I cuss a lot too. It's mm -hmm. hard to not to cuss. Or, and again, like my free flowing, non denominational state at, at the current moment mm -hmm. plays against me in the sense that I can't. If I'm going to be a priest or a pastor, okay. Well, let's say I do want to be a priest or a pastor. Which denomination do I go? You don't have to worry about it. I mean, it's a, it's not one thing about, uh, I mean, I'm not saying that you have a vocation, it's all right if you don't, but when you do have a vocation, it, it, becomes, it becomes clear to you, it's, it's, a, it's a joint operation. It's not like you have to, oh, I wonder what God wants me to do now, what am I going to make the wrong decision? No, God makes it clear. Right. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you've got, you're, you're in a, a partnership with God when it comes to that. Absolutely. And, and what makes matters even more complicated is when I look at uh, monks and the fact that they can't get married and I don't want to, you know, ax that option because I, I do want to get married and have kids. Like that's, that's one of my uh, ambitions mm -hmm. in life. It's not now because I'm really focusing on what I'm doing right now. So it's, I'm not open for it now, but like I know that I want to keep that option open. Mm -hmm. So um, someone who has the vocation for priesthood in the certain denominations, uh, sometimes they're, they're going to have to come to terms with the fact that they can't have families. And, we we I, we kind of tossed that ball around, and I came to understand something I didn't know before, where the responsibility that they have is so great that you know the, the congregation are for the kids in a sense, which you know obviously it's up to debate, and, but that's the perspective, and I'm probably saying it very poorly, but um, yeah, like ha, in, like they, they they told me like okay, Chris, imagine having a family and. Um, being a pastor or a priest at the same time, like it's it's extremely hard to juggle yeah. both. Yeah, that's really the Roman party line, um, and I, I'm not saying that it's wrong. It's just that I know many a priest with a family, and they do fine. The thing is, uh, when you make too much of a distinction between the priesthood and the congregation, I think that's when when that kind of narrative comes into play. You know, that I am dad, mm -hmm. you call yourself father. Right, and then yeah. everybody, you know, yes, father, and then you become childlike. Whereas in other traditions, uh, that, like I, I'll stand up in the pulpit and I say, you guys, you know, you're just as holy as I am. You, your your role is to not to watch me be holy. Right. Your role is to take on holiness. So when I give the the host to my my congregation after I've done the consecration, I offer it to them and I say, the gift of God for you, the holy people of God. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that, right. that they're just as holy as I am. Right. And that they manifest their holiness in their lives the way I manifest my holiness in my life. And there's not a big disparity. So, right. but, but that's that's not the Roman tradition, I know that. Yeah, this, yeah there are different arguments that, that are made and that I kind of listen to. Like I kind of get, you know, lend my ear to everybody to see like what their different perspectives are. And, um, I, I don't want to take a stance that still says, okay, I, I'm going to agree with the, the Roman Catholics and not with the Anglicans or vice right, versa, like that's not what I'm doing. Um, but I do appreciate the different uh, perceptions. Yeah, absolutely. It's a one way of looking at it. Yeah. Absolutely, it is. Um, so so you, what, what class did you teach at Concordia? At Concordia, English Second Language. Oh, okay. Like, so, yeah. 102, 103, 104. Interesting. So, yeah, so just like you said, I have one of my good friends actually did history at, uh, well, I'm not sure if he did history, but I, he, he's doing history now at UCAM, but he did. His studies at Sejab Zumoyan, and then he, he might have had you as a, as a professor. Maybe. Well, uh, but I, I stopped teaching there for a long time back, so I haven't taught at Concordia for a while. I right. uh, lived here for a while. Um, so we're approaching the hour, the hour and 50 mark, and okay. I think it was a, a great conversation. Yeah. Um, so if we can segue toward the end here, and, and just uh, not necessarily, I mean, we can definitely keep talking for hours because all these different issues, like when it comes to uh, social movements, uh, denominational differences, they, they're all, in and of themselves, they all deserve their own, you know, podcast session. Mm -hmm. um, I always like to end with, you know, asking the guests to give some final thoughts, like, to, to the viewers and, and to 
basically, whether it be from their own experience or just their own philosophy or mindset, like, what would be your final thoughts just to close off the session? I think my final thought would be to, for people to remember that they're beloved, um, to remember that they're unique, they don't have to fight for God's love, that God's love is a given, and that what we do in the world, the way we strive to be, have integrity in the world, is to respond to God's love. Not to do things so that we can finally deserve God's love, we already have it, but in response to God's love, we give love into the world. And that, I think, is our, our main purpose. And how we find that purpose is between us and God. And then ultimately between the community that we get, that gathers around us. So, you know, it's it's like what Jesus said, my my yoke is easy, my burden is light. It's still a yoke, it's still a burden, right. but it's easy and it's light. And so we can dance to the world with joy. Yeah, so, yeah, we, we should remember that we are beloved and we're the flock. And, yeah, that's, that's super important because a lot of people tend to lose hope on that and, all the, you know, there's another social issue, the you know the spike in suicide rates and losing hope and you know self harm, self hate and that kind of thing. So yeah, knowing that there is a Lord and a Savior out there, you know, I think I think that's a nice anchoring point for people, not only people of faith, but for people to understand that there is something greater, you know, atheist or not, you know, greater and benevolent. Right. Uh, so atheist or theistic, like it's and benevolent, right? Those out of their own will, right? Uh, their own. Uh, is there another word for will? Their own grace. Volition. Volition. There you go. So uh, it's going to be it for today, guys. Uh, episode 14 is uh, now uh, coming to an end. Uh, I've already had a, a good time you know, talking yeah. about all these different things. And uh, this was uh, uh, Reverend Holmes' first ever podcast, and uh, hopefully not the last one. Uh, stay tuned for um, Sammy Rakik. Sammy Rakik is actually a seminarian. Uh, he's Algerian. He was formerly Muslim, converted to Christianity. He's going to talk about his experience on Monday. So uh, hopefully you guys are going to stay tuned for that. Very, very important uh, topic. A very interesting and intriguing topic to understand, like the nitty-gritty of how do you go from uh, transitioning from Islam into Christianity and what type of uh, familial discord that may, that may generate. So that's going to be a very spicy and interesting topic to cover. And on that note, uh, thank you so much for being here. And Pleasure. It's a wrap. All right, I'm just going to press that uh, button because I don't have a remote control to actually turn this thing off, which actually helps. So. Yeah, that's what we're editing. Right. So well, this for, is interesting. For the next three seconds, we're not exactly off the record. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. I'll try not to swear.